Hi everyone, it's Naharika with another SAT Biology video. Today we're going to be talking about both the respiratory and the circulatory system, and we're going to dive right in with the circulatory system. Now, this system is made up of three major components, the first one being the blood, the second one being the blood vessels, and the third being the heart. And we're going to start off by talking about the blood. Now, the blood isn't only made up of cells, it's also made up of plasma. And plasma is mostly water, but it also carries glucose, hormones, ions, and proteins, including albumin, fibrinogen, and lipoproteins, all of which are made in the liver. And the plasma composes half of what is actually your blood, or the blood volume. Now the other half is made up of cells, and all of the blood cells in your body are made in the bone marrow. The first type of cell we're going to talk about is the red blood cell, which composes 45% of the total blood volume, and these are filled with hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a protein made with iron that helps to carry oxygen in your body. Because plasma takes up 50% and the red blood cells take up 45%, we have a remaining 5% that's made up of your white blood cells and the platelets. White blood cells are phagocytes and they participate in immunity and your platelets are cell fragments that are really important in blood clotting. Some white blood cells are called lymphocytes, and these are divided into your B cells and your T cells. And the T cells are further divided into your helper and your killer T cells. B cells produce antibodies that bind to foreign substances in the body and mark them. Your helper T cells assist the other cells to divide, and your killer T cells kill cells that have been infected by a virus. HIV lives within your helper T cells and kills them, and because your helper T cells are super important to your other cells, HIV patients are often very susceptible to disease. As I said before, platelets are small cell fragments that are used in blood clotting because they release a chemical that initiates a series of events that convert the fibrinogen to fibrin, which are these insoluble threads that create this big web of blood cells, and create a clot to stop any further bleeding. Now we're going to talk about blood typing, which is a method to determine what proteins are expressed on the outside of your red blood cells. Now the easiest way to think about this is that there is an I gene with three different alleles, and the alleles are A, B, and I, or for our purposes, O. If somebody has an A allele, that means that they have the type A protein on the surface of their red blood cells, and the same goes for B. But in the case of the lowercase i, or the O, it represents an absence of any proteins within the system along the surface. Now, the A and the B are both dominant to the lowercase i, but the A and the B are codominant to each other, meaning if you have both alleles together, they are both expressed instead of one being expressed over the other. Now the table makes this a little bit easier to understand. Basically, if you want to pause it here, look it over. It follows the same genetics rules we discussed earlier. And remember that the lowercase i, when I say blood type, lowercase i is equivalent to the O blood type. One of the questions you're really likely to get regarding blood typing is a transfusion question. And the one thing to remember if you get faced or stuck with one of these questions is if you get a transfusion, if you get somebody else's blood into your bloodstream, the body is going to react if it doesn't, if it's never seen these proteins before. Now, if you're a type AB person, you have both proteins already, you've seen all the proteins that you can, nothing's going to surprise you later on, you can get any blood type that you're given. So that's why type AB blood is known as the universal recipient, because it there are no strangers. But on the other hand, with type O blood, everything's a stranger because type O blood means that they have no proteins, so if they see any protein, it's going to agglutinate or clump. On the flip side, because type O blood has no proteins, there are no proteins that the body won't recognize if it is given to any other blood type. Because if I were to give a type O blood to type A blood type, they wouldn't freak out like, oh my goodness, there's a new protein I've never seen before because there are no proteins on type O blood. And that's why type O blood is known as the universal donor. Now we're going to start our conversation on blood vessels. Blood vessels are basically the tubes that carry blood throughout your body. 
Now, blood vessels have different names based on where they're carrying the blood to and how big they are. So we're going to start at the heart, and the blood that carries, or the blood vessels that carry blood away from the heart are known as arteries. And as they get smaller, they're called arterioles, and then they get even smaller than that, and they're called capillaries. Capillaries are the smallest blood vessels in the body, and they allow for easy gas exchange because they're so thin for gases and nutrients between your blood and your organs. Now, as capillaries begin to lead back to the heart, they slowly get bigger and bigger, and at first they're known as venules, and then they're labeled as veins right before they come back to the heart. Because most veins defy gravity coming up and back to your heart, they have valves in them to make sure that the blood keeps going up, and valves are pretty much like pockets, so just in case some falls, it grabs onto some of the blood to keep it moving. A really common mistake that people make is thinking that arteries and veins are associated with whether blood has oxygen or whether it doesn't, but that is incorrect. I'll prove it in a little bit. Don't think like that if you do think like that already. As well, in this process, some of your cellular fluid is lost in the tissues from the capillaries, and in order to bring it back so we don't lose all of our blood to our organs, we have the lymphatic system. Now, the lymphatic system is a group of vessels that originate at the tissues and end at the veins just before the heart. And in the process of recapturing this intracellular fluid, it also filters the blood using these concentrated areas of white blood cells known as lymph nodes and they filter it to make sure that the blood is healthy. Lymphatic vessels and the veins are pretty similar because both of them don't have any muscle in their walls, but they both have valves because, again, they're defying gravity for the most part. And the flow of lymph through your lymphatic system, as is the flow of blood through your veins, is only based on muscular contractions. So if you end up staying in one place for a very long time, you can have swelling, which is also known as an edema. Next, we're going to start talking about the human heart. Now, the heart pumps in two circuits at the same time, so one in which the blood goes to the lungs and back to the heart, which is called the pulmonary circuit, and the other where blood goes from the heart to the body and back to the heart, called the systemic circuit. The human heart is made up of four chambers. The top two are the left and the right atria, and the bottom two are the left and right ventricles. Now, starting with the pulmonary circuit, oxygen low blood will enter the right atrium for the, from the superior and the inferior vena cava, and then transfer it through the tricuspid valve into your right ventricle, where it is then pumped to the lungs via the pulmonary artery, and the blood comes back oxygenated through the pulmonary veins. This is the example where blood leaving through an artery is actually deoxygenated. Now we'll move on to the systemic circuit which continues with the oxygen-rich blood that came back from the lungs through the veins, the pulmonary veins, into the left atrium. This blood then travels through the bicuspid valve into the left ventricle, where it is pumped through the aorta to the rest of the body. Now, the characteristic sound of the heart is known as the lub-dub sound, which is characterized by the atrioventricular valves closing and then the semilunar valves closing. The heart is also controlled by an extensive conduction system, but the only thing you really need to know for the SAT bio test is that it begins at the sinoatrial node, and that's what starts the heartbeat. So when the ventricles contract, it is known as systole, and if you know anything about taking your blood pressure, this is related to your systolic pressure. And when the ventricles relax, it is called diastole, and this creates the diastolic pressure. Now we're going to move on to the respiratory system. The respiratory system is in charge of moving air in and out of the lungs through ventilation, and it exchanges gas with the blood, cleverly known as gas exchange, and it facilitates the regulation of pH in the body. Now the respiratory system is composed of multiple parts, and the first we're going to talk about is known as the conduction zone, because all it does is it moves air in and out of the body, but no gas exchange actually occurs here. So we're going to start off with the nose, whose function is to warm, humidify, and filter the air before it travels down to the pharynx, which is the throat, and into the windpipe, known as the trachea. The trachea then splits into two tubes, called the right and left primary bronchi, and similar to the arteries, the bronchi branch into smaller and smaller tubes, then referred to as the secondary bronchi, tertiary bronchi, and the bronchioles. 
Another important thing to know about the trachea and all of the bronchial tubes is that they have cells that secrete mucus to trap any dirt, and the cilia on the outside of the cells move the dirt out of your body. Next, we're going to talk about the respiratory zone, which is where we have gas exchange. Now, the smallest bronchioles have extremely thin walls and form a bubble shape called alveoli. They almost look like bunches of grapes. Capillaries then surround the alveoli, and remember, capillaries are the smallest blood vessels, and this will allow for extremely easy gas exchange. What's important to remember about the human body and blood is that our pH needs to be in this pretty narrow range from 7.35 to 7.45. And because carbon dioxide doesn't dissolve well in the blood, it is actually converted then into carbonic acid, which can be kind of dangerous when trying to maintain this small range. So our body creates this buffer known as the bicarbonate ion. Next, we're going to talk about breathing. So breathing involves the diaphragm, which is this domed-shaped muscle under your lungs, and some of the muscles in your chest wall. So when the diaphragm contracts, it actually flattens and increases the amount of space within your chest cavity. And doing this will decrease the air pressure inside the body and air will rush into the lungs. So this is what happens every time you inhale and the technical term for when you inhale is called inspiration. And then when you breathe out, the opposite happens. So the diaphragm will relax and push up, almost like it's pushing the air out of your chest cavity because it decreases the volume.